Peter Singer is among the most influential of philosophers in the world today. He's also one of the most controversial. An Australian, since 1999, he's been the Princeton professor of bioethics. He's a secular thinker in the utilitarian tradition and believes that the utility or usefulness of our actions should be judged upon their consequences or outcomes in maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. The central motivation of Singer's work is to reduce the suffering of sentient beings, those that can feel pain. And since 2011, he's been persuaded that those who reject objectivism in ethics are on the defensive. He believes that there are moral facts and you can be right or wrong about them. As suffering is an ontological fact in the universe, it's self-evident to human reasoning that we ought to reduce unnecessary and pointless suffering. This position offers more leverage against self-centered egoists who care nothing for the environment or the suffering of others. Singh is perhaps most famous for three movements in practical ethics. Effective altruism, which encourages people to give away a percentage of their income to those that are suffering in the world and alleviating poverty. Animal welfare, which seeks to persuade people to stop eating meat, uh, to stop experimenting on animals, and to boycott cruel practices and factory farming. And thirdly, the liberalization of laws on abortion, euthanasia, and infanticide. Singer really carved out this new discipline of practical ethics in the 1970s. He combined the academic with the activist with the conviction that if it isn't practical, it isn't ethics. The intention of the movement is, in Marx's phrase, not to describe the world, but to change it. And he reinvigorated the social reforming tradition of Bentham and Mill uh, in utilitarianism. The 1970s was an era of protest. And this was a generation of baby boomers that had grown up with television that had a more global awareness of the world. They were protesting at the Vietnam War, at the proliferation of nuclear weapons, at industrial pollution of the environment. The civil rights movement had intensified after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And the feminist movement was reinvigorated. And all of this shook the intellectual establishment. And even in the conservative world of Oxford in the 1970s, philosophers were beginning to break out of the straitjacket of logical positivism with its claims of the verification principle that if a statement couldn't be proven true or false in terms of logic or sense experience, then it was meaningless. All of this had the effect of shutting down political discourse and practical or applied ethics. AJS said that it was silly as well as presumptuous for philosophers to pose as champions of virtue. And C.D. Broad warned that philosophers have no call to undertake those hortatory functions which are so adequately performed by clergymen, politicians and lead writers. Logical positivism had made for an arid climate that few philosophers uh, dared venture into the world of political claims or practical judgments in ethics. It shut down the oughtness of ethics. And into this world came Singer in 1969 as a young postgraduate student, studying under R. M. Hare for his B. Phil. Hare was no ivory tower thinker. He'd been a Japanese prisoner of war from 1942 to 5 in the infamous Burma Thai Railway. And he tried to develop a system that might serve as a guide to life in the harshest of conditions. He saw that logical positivism had focused on emotions in debate and minimized the role for reason. And he was supportive of Singer's B. Phil thesis topic of civil disobedience, which was more practical. So Singer says, there was already a bit of change in the air and people like R. M. Hare were open to me tackling more applied topics. I was pushing on a door, which if it wasn't open, was certainly not locked. As an undergraduate, Singer had been president of the Melbourne University campaign against conscription, um, opposing the Australian government's involvement in sending troops uh, as allies of the US in Vietnam. He'd also campaigned for the legalization of abortion. So as he stepped onto the stage of Oxford philosophy as a young postgrad, he understood the momentum of galvanizing a protest movement around a cause. This was a new generation of academics who'd grown up in an era of activism, and they were out not just to change minds, but to change government policy and behavior. 
several new academic journals sprang up on business ethics and environmental ethics and medical ethics. And one of the first of these was philosophy and public affairs. And Singer was published alongside Thomas Nagel, John Rawls, and Judith Jarvis Thompson in the first edition. As we said, Marx famously observed that philosophers have only interpreted the world, but our task is to change it. And in 1974, in the New York Review, uh, New York Times Magazine, Singer traces a brief overview of the 20th century of moral philosophy. And he boldly announces that having excluded themselves from political uh, engagement or practical ethics for much of the 20th century, philosophers are now back on the job. In this lecture, we're going to look at three movements uh, in practical ethics, which Singer has provided the intellectual foundations for. Effective altruism, animal welfare, and the shift from the sanctity of life ethic to the quality of life ethic. He's persuaded people, but he's also galvanized movements in doing so. And a signature move of Singer's is borrowed from his tutor R.M. Hare and his critical two levels of thinking. At the intuitive, unreflective level of our ordinary assumptions, we uh, have certain beliefs in ethics. And these work very well, except when they come up against contentious or complex cases, or when the number of counterexamples um, lead to a collapse of the old ethic because it's simply not able to provide solutions to these problems. Singer uses the example of a camera. He says it's rather like if you have a digital camera and you have it in automatic mode, you just point and shoot. And ordinarily that works very well. But in conditions of low lighting or where there's a very fast moving target, you might need to switch it to the manual mode. And here you need a great deal more skill in using all of the sophisticated elements of a, a modern camera. And in much the same way, this is the role that a moral expert, a philosopher, can bring in ethical uh, discourse. So using this uh, signature move, Singer frequently takes us from ordinary intuitions that we hold uh, as a society or as individuals and pushes us towards what seem at first to be very counterintuitive principles that he then defends. One example of this is in one of his most frequently reprinted uh, articles, Famine, Affluence and Morality. It was written in 1971 in response to the Bengal famine, when <clears throat> the humanitarian crisis was such that refugee camps were pushed beyond their limits, and uh, Singer is persuading people to give a percentage of their income to uh, help out in the absence of, of government doing so. And he pushes against this uh, intuition we have that giving to charity is something that's laudable, but it's supererogatory. It's something that's good to do, but it's not bad not to do. And he wants to challenge us on the principle of sacrifice, that if it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable importance, we ought morally to do it. Put more simply, this means that I ought to give until the point that by giving more, I would cause as much suffering to myself and my dependents as I would relieve by my gift. He moderates this principle for the sake of realism, but he really wants to push against affluent Western consumers who don't consider it their duty to concern themselves with refugee um, uh, refugees in, in, in Bengal in a famine, or the bottom billion in the world today, or the 500 million people who die every year from malaria. So at the critical level of reflection, Singer is trying to establish the principle of the equal consideration of interests, and to challenge the complacency of Western affluent consumers about the 3.1 million children that die each year of undernutrition. And he sets out to expand our circle of obligation uh, in a now famous thought experiment called the shallow pond. He asks us to imagine walking past a shallow pond in which a child is drowning and there's no one else at hand. And we, perhaps losing uh, a brand new pair of shoes in the process, could step in and save this child's life. And we would think it was our duty and obligation to do so. But he wants to argue that this extends far beyond um, that uh, 
individual instance and our, our obligation doesn't diminish with distance. Just as an aside here, in 1938, Singer's parents, who were Austrian Jews, were trying to get a visa out of Vienna. And through an acquaintance that Singer's mother had met just once, who was Australian, they got sponsorship to come to Australia and their lives were saved, where three of Singer's grandparents uh, died in the Holocaust. So he has reason to be thankful for the kindness of a distant stranger. And his argument is that in omitting to give to a charity, we are effectively committing uh, a murder because as a consequentialist, the results are exactly the same. And so on the principle of marginal utility, you and I ought to give up to the point when we would become destitute ourselves uh, or have the same quality of life as the victim of a famine. And he points out this isn't a new idea. Thomas Aquinas wrote, whatever a man has in superabundance is owed of natural right to the poor for their sustenance. Now, one critic of Singer's at this point says, well, this position is absurd because it would logically lead to everyone having to give up their kidney because other people are in need of kidneys. And interestingly, someone who read that article, rather than accept the absurdity of Singer's position, went ahead and gave up their kidney. It's certainly a very exacting position, and it's launched a movement now called Effective Altruism. Singer's written a series of books, um, The Most Good You Can Do, How We To Live, and The Life You Can Save, and he's set up a charity, um, and he seeks to sell the ethical life not as a guilt trip, but as a vision of the most fulfilling way to live. He sets out the paradox of hedonism, that the more we seek pleasure for its own sake, the emptier it becomes, and he contrasts this with research about the unhappiness of the treadmill of consumer lifestyle and spending and the increased happiness of people who live altruistically and give towards uh, charitable um, uh, causes. He says, the most solid basis of self-esteem is to live an ethical life, which contributes to the greatest extent to making the world a better place. Effective altruism is altruistic in that it asks people to be self-sacrificial, to give 10% or more of their income to uh, charity, and it's effective insofar as it uses charity evaluator tools and websites that go after large-scale neglected and um, uh, problems where, where high impact can be made. It would target our money towards deworming charities and anti-malarial charities, and Singer's got a, a, a global platform where he can promote such causes. His TED talk on this and on effective altruism has been viewed 1.8 million times, and I would point you to that to learn more about this movement. Another movement that Singer has been involved in is to elevate the moral status of animals. And at the heart of this is the intuition we ordinarily have of speciesism. That is a term that's analogous with sexism or racism in Singer's mind, and it's to not extend the principle of the equal consideration of interests to the suffering of non-human animals. At the critical level, Singer wants to replace sentience um, instead of species as the morally crucial factor um, in extending um, our concern for the suffering of animals. We should develop a new view of the wrongness of killing, he says, that depends on some characteristics of particular beings rather than their species membership. And this leads to characteristically provocative statements to challenge our intuitions. If we consider it legitimate to kill higher primates for experimental purposes when no immediately useful knowledge is likely to be derived, we should instead prioritize the use of brain-dead humans. Or if we were to compare attitudes about speciesism today with past racist attitudes, we would have to say that we're back at the days when the slave trade was still legal. For Singer, human infants have little more in terms of self-awareness or preferences than that of an adult chimp. Take Coco the gorilla, who had a sign language vocabulary of over a thousand words and could even use language to lie or tell jokes. Singer says that we need to change our attitudes both to humans and to non-humans so that they come together at some point between the two extremes.
And an obstacle in the way of this and of increasing animal welfare is this view that we're different in kind but not in degree um, from uh, animals, this uh, species boundary that Judeo-Christian ethics has set in the Western conscience. Long after Darwin and secularization, the uh, values of Judeo-Christian ethics are embedded in the Western conscience. Critics think that Singer is wrongly scapegoating Judeo-Christian ethics at this point when the real villain is the growing global demand for meat and to have it at a cheap price and the um, in uninhibited profit motive of the factory farming industry. And they point to a long tradition in which dominion in Genesis is interpreted in terms of stewardship in the work of Francis of Assisi or William Wilberforce, one of the founders of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in 1824. They, Singer, however, thinks this is a minority view and he's well aware of, of modern thinkers like Andrew Lindsay or David Kloss two-volume work on animal theology, but he doesn't think this is the mainstream position, which is far more to do with dominion in terms of domination and exploitation of nature. So what is Singer's journey into vegetarianism and concern for animal welfare? Well, the realization dawned on him in a moment in Oxford in what he describes as an encounter that changed my life. He was invited by a fellow graduate student to Balliol College for lunch, and the choice on the menu was salad or um, a meat option, um, spaghetti bolognese. And when his friend chose salad um, and then explained to him his reasons for vegetarianism, it really got him thinking. And Singer is convinced by this adage that if it's not practical, it isn't ethics. And so he and his wife, Renata, soon changed to become vegetarian. And there was a small movement of vegetarians at that time uh, among philosophers uh, and thinkers in Oxford. Soon afterwards, he wrote an article for the New York Review of Books called Animal Liberation, and they then invited him to write a book on this. And as he moved to New York University to lecture for a year, he drew on American factory farming case studies, and he used the media profile that uh, he had in uh, New York to get uh, more impact for uh, this idea than um, similar books had had in uh, the UK. Um, it was an idea whose time had come. We had the, uh, the black liberation movement, the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, and um, there was a sense that the interests or the equal consideration of interests could be extended to animals as people became aware of uh, how factory farming works. Singer has an ability to be very accessible and persuasive in his writing and case studies. Uh, his account of the cruelty of the race to the abattoir, 42 days in terms of turning grain into chicken meat, or his account of toxicity tests on rabbits' uh, eyes, all indicated the profit maximization motives of the farming industry. And with a global figure of 56 uh, billion animals that are every year raised for slaughter and human consumption, this is an issue that hasn't gone away. Animals' lives are often more of a burden than a benefit to them. And as Singer says, in one respect, animals are our equal. They suffer. Practical ethics, as we've said, combines the academic rigor with activism. And Singer walks the talk. He's a vegan who wears no animal products. He was arrested in 1992 for protesting on uh, the pig farm of the then Australian um, Prime Minister. And uh, he raised attention of how sows had uh, neck chains, um, which uh, were later banned by the New South Wales government. He stood as a Green Party candidate for the Australian Senate. And together with dedicated activists like Henry Spira, he started a movement that brought media and consumer pressure to bear on big companies like Avon and McDonald's. An early victory was with Revlon, who diverted $750,000 into animal-free testing of cosmetic products. And so when you see not tested on animals today, you can thank Singer and Spira. Today, the law on uh, battery cages, how veal calves are raised, uh, restricted conditions under which higher primates can be used in medical experiments um, have all changed. And 500,000 copies uh, of Singer's Animal Liberation uh, have, have, have done an awful lot to change people's behavior towards vegetarianism.
as Colin McGinn, the philosopher, puts it, this is a one argument. A third movement that Singer has been at the forefront of is the replacement of the sanctity of life ethic with the quality of life ethic. And this goes back to his undergraduate days uh, protesting for the legalization of abortion in Australia. And if we think of the liberalization of laws on abortion and euthanasia globally, there has been massive change since um, 1960s uh, on this. But here I want to focus on the most controversial and distinctive of Singer's claims, and that's infanticide. He's frequently misrepresented as advocating the killing of disabled children. Instead, what he's arguing is that in limited cases where severely disabled newborns face prolonged and pointless suffering, parents should be given a greater say on whether their disabled child lives or dies. As he writes, parents may, with good reason, regret that a disabled child was born. So if the life of an infant will be so miserable as not to be worth living, it's better that the child should be helped to die without further suffering. This stems from Singer's work in the 1980s as the chair of the Melbourne Centre for Human Bioethics. And there he discussed with specialists in neonatal care lots of heart-rending case studies that they were facing with uh, the new technologies uh, of neonatal intensive care wards that were available. One such example was infants that were born with spina bifida, a condition that involves the opening of the spine and frequently leads to paralysis beneath the waist. It was more common than it is today, uh, partly because prenatal screening techniques today make this an issue of abortion rather than infanticide. And without surgery, spina bifida babies would die, but not immediately. Sometimes it would take weeks or even months. And so Singer writes, the obvious alternative to trying to bring up a severely handicapped and mentally and physically handicapped child would be a swift and painless death for the infant. It was not available because the law enforces the idea that the infant's life is sacred and cannot be terminated. Some doctors operated on those infants that were less severely affected, but the others who developed an infection in their open wound in the spine were allowed to die over a period of days, even months, and uh, treatment was withheld. So um, Singer is, is rare in this respect in that he talks openly about uh, killing. Four out of ten or twelve chapters of practical ethics are given over to the issue of killing of embryos and um, newborns and in euthanasia. In a book with his colleague, uh, Should the Baby Live?, he argues for infanticide in certain cases, and um, in today's neonatal, neonatal uh, intensive care wards, where there are highly effective means of preventing death, um, the new technology raises lots of dilemmas for doctors uh, as to the extent to which life-saving interventions are justifiable. What Singer wants to do is to challenge our intuitions about the intrinsic and equal worth of all lives, regardless of their quality. And as we said, in a post-Darwinian, secularized world, we may well have dispensed with the idea that people are made in God's image, or that they have the breath of God in, in terms of a living soul within them. But the belief in the inviolability and even the sanctity of life and the equality of all lives, regardless of, uh, of health, is deeply entrenched in Western attitudes and, and conscience and intuitions. In a series of books called Unsanctifying Human Life, Rethinking Life and Death and Should the Baby Live, Singer promotes a very different view. He says, after ruling our thoughts and attitudes um, for 2,000 years, the sanctity of human life, the traditional Western ethic, has collapsed, simply not able to cope with the array of modern medical dilemmas. And there's a kind of hinge here between Singer's view about the elevation of the rights and interests of animals on the one hand, and a humbler view of humans who are different in degree but not kind from animals. Vets routinely put animals out of their misery, uh, out of compassion, and Singer thinks that doctors ought to be able to do so too if parents so wish. When life becomes biological but not biographical, more of a burden than a benefit, then 
the sanctity of life gives rise to two particular harms, to infants whose misery is prolonged and to non-humans whose interests are ignored. Controversy makes Singer something of a hate figure in this respect and there have been protests at his appointment in 1999 to Princeton by uh, disabled rights groups and there are even death threats. He had to abandon lecture tours in Germany and Austria uh, on titles like Do Severely Disabled Newborns Have a Right to Life? because people thought this was a, a slippery slope back to Nazi eugenics. But as a consequentialist, Singer's focus is in reducing suffering. And as a utilitarian, judging actions on their outcomes, he thinks that there's little distinction between killing and letting die. In fact, he finds it odd that pro-life and disability rights groups target him with their anger, thinking of him as a moral monster, when quality of life judgments are routinely made in healthcare wards uh, around the world in an unspoken and ad hoc way when treatment is withdrawn or where or only ordinary means of extending a life are, ex are given, not extraordinary means like um, surgery or more aggressive interventions. So Singer thinks that um, we ought to speak openly about times when terminating a life um, is justifiable. As he says, if it is justifiable to withhold available forms of treatment, knowing that this will result in the death of an infant, what possible grounds can there be for refusing uh, to kill the infant painlessly? And in rethinking life and death, he even uh, suggests five new commandments, which are to recognize that the value of uh, and worth of a life varies, to take responsibility for the consequences of our decisions, to respect a person's desire to live or die, to bring children into the world only if they're wanted, and uh, not to discriminate on the basis of species. He wants to point out how distinctively Christian this idea of the sanctity of human life is and the prohibition on infanticide is. If you go back to the cultures of Sparta or Athens or Rome or the South Sea Islands or Greenland, you'll see that infanticide of sickly infants or deformed infants isn't only permitted but it's often encouraged and sometimes even obligatory. And uh, he sees this as a deeply theological claim. In the Middle Ages, the tragedy of a child dying was worse than that of an adult because if it was unbaptized, then it hadn't been cleansed of original sin and its eternal destiny was in doubt. So in Singer's moral theory, we again see this signature move of taking a deeply embedded intuition uh, about the inviolability of all human life regardless of its quality and the defense of a counterintuitive principle. In this case, it's the principle of total replaceability. When the death of a disabled infant will lead to the birth of another infant with better prospects of a happy life, the total amount of happiness will be greater if the disabled infant is killed. The loss of happy life for the first infant is outweighed by the gain of a happier life for the second. In The Spectator, he's even suggested that a month after birth, there could be a ceremony at which we confer rights upon a child that are the same as every other person has. Singer's aware that this seems like an appalling argument to many people, and he says that the only relevant difference to abortion is one of timing. We already accept the total replaceability principle uh, in uh, terms of abortion. What justifies parents in ending their severely disabled newborn's life is this new language he introduces of personhood. And higher primates, like uh, chimps or gorillas, can be persons. Indeed, he's founded the Great Ape Project to establish rights uh, for the, the, the great apes. But on the other hand, humans who are in a persistent vegetative state or who, like Singer's own mother, are in late-stage Alzheimer's, or are a fetus or a newborn, are not persons. And this is because there's a criteria that have to be met in order to reach the watermark of personhood. The seriousness of killing a being relates to its consciousness of the future, its self-awareness, um, its capacity to have desires and preferences for the future, its ability to feel pain, to interact with others, 
and even to reason. Consider the following statements that Singer makes. Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons. On any fair comparison of morally relevant characteristics like rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, autonomy, pleasure and pain, the calf, the pig and the much derided chicken come out well ahead of the fetus at any stage of pregnancy. Or, since neither the newborn human infant nor a fish is a person, the wrongness of killing such beings is not the wrongness of killing a person. Killing a disabled infant is not morally equivalent to killing a person. Very often, it's not wrong at all. There are major criticisms of Singer on infanticide, and I'll just list a few of them here. The first is that this introduces a sweeping license to take newborn life, and there might not be good utilitarian reasons to confine the killing just to severely disabled newborns or those that are terminally ill. Once you introduce the idea of a life not worth living, is this not a slippery slope to Nazi eugenics? Well, having lost three of his grandparents in the Holocaust, Singer is well aware of the horror of state-sponsored eugenics in which uh, groups that are deemed undesirable are eliminated. But he sees no evidence from the social laboratory of the Netherlands where liberalized laws on euthanasia and abortion haven't led to uh, a looser control on the taking of life in general. A second argument is that Singer weakens his position on animal rights and welfare that more people might be sympathetic to by allying it to um, this unsanctifying of human life. And Singer's response is that he has a consistent aim of reducing unnecessary and pointless suffering, and that's the motive behind both of these um, projects. A third uh, problem is that maybe Singer is a little naive about the, the extent of prejudices that exist in our society towards the disabled that he assumes that goodwill and virtues of respect and compassion towards disabled newborns exist and that they will always be there. And here he acknowledges that I can see that we were not sufficiently sensitive to prejudice in the community in general, in the medical profession, perhaps even in ourselves against people with disabilities, and didn't give sufficient attention to the quality of life possible for people with disabilities. That raises the problem that it's very difficult to judge the future happiness of disabled newborns. And if you're a consequentialist, your uh, ethical judgments are all premised upon um, predicting the future. A 2011 Harvard study found that people with Down syndrome express a very high level of satisfaction in the quality of their personal fulfillment and their lives. And in later editions of Practical Ethics, Singer says, Whereas previously I thought that parents and doctors should make decisions for their disabled infants, I now say that parents, if they're at all uncertain, should contact organizations representing those who have the particular disability their infant has. Uh, the point is that doctors are not best informed um, to help uh, those parents understand um, what life is like for a particular disability. And it's an empirical point you have to have the best information to bring about the best consequences. For others, there's an inconsistency between the language, the pro-disability language of inclusion in our society and law and um, the kind of prenatal screening that has a eugenic logic behind it um, that sees the world as somehow improved if disability is eliminated. The presence of disability and, and disabled people makes little sense in the logic of capitalist economies and in a world where cost-benefit analysis introduces terms like disability-adjusted life years. It puts the disabled low down on the funding priorities of the state. And preferences of individuals aren't in a vacuum. They're informed by the background assumptions and prejudices of society. If we consider the 40,000 people in the UK Down syndrome community, we might ask how they feel about these new non-invasive prenatal tests, which in countries like Denmark and Iceland have led to virtually 100% uh, abortion rates. Singer does little to allay fears at this point, saying it doesn't seem wise to add to the burden on limited resources by increasing the number of disabled children 
who will, if they're to lead a worthwhile life, need a disproportionately large share of the resources. Or again, if it costs £500,000 to save the life of an extremely premature infant, and that could pay for 100 uh, replacement hip operations in elderly patients, what's the better use of the money? There's another problem that this could erode doctor-patient trust and that when you introduce intentional killing into the medical profession, you change the fundamental nature of medicine and it becomes a subjective decision about whose life is worth living. It can become a form of social engineering and maximize the benefit um, of, uh, of cost-benefit analysis in society. One of the most telling critics of Singer is Harriet McBride Johnson, the late disabled rights activist and lawyer who was herself severely paralyzed from birth. She was invited by Singer to speak at Princeton and converse with some of the undergraduates there. And she later wrote, I've been sucked into a civil discussion of whether I ought to exist. He simply thinks it would have been better to have had my parents given the option of killing the baby I once was and thereby to avoid the suffering that comes with lives like mine. Singer is infected with the common social prejudices about disability. As a shield against the terrible purity of Singer's vision, I'll look to the corruption that comes from interconnectedness. To justify my hopes that Singer's theoretical world won't become real, I'll invoke the muck and the mess of disabled lives well lived. Singer is undoubtedly an influential, fascinating and contentious philosopher and he's certainly one of the principal architects of the practical ethics movement. A good place to start with his thought is to go to petersinger.info. He responds to uh, his critics at length, including Harriet McBride Johnson um, in Peter Singer Under Fire and the range of Christian responses to Peter Singer uh, move from the polemical in Rethinking Peter Singer, edited by Gordon Priest, through to the more conciliatory Peter Singer and Christian Ethics Beyond Polarization by Charles Camozzi. In 2011, in an Oxford conference run by the McDonald Centre, he addressed the question, Christian Ethics uh, Engages Peter Singer, and this led to the book God, the Good and Utilitarianism. You'll find links to these um, and an article I've written uh, on this website.